We ready? Okay. Psalm 62. I have some, uh, some good questions to think about as we look at this psalm. So uh, hopefully this will be, be a nice time of discussion. I said in an email last week, we used to do Wednesdays as more of a close-knit discussion type thing. But with COVID, where we all were staying as far away apart from each other as we could and everything else, we switched to a more sermonette or homily format, um, which worked okay. Um, but let's weigh your coffee. But um, we, um, we decided to go to this. Ralph inspired us to try this out again and go back to this just to have interaction and discussion on Wednesdays, a low key Bible study discussion. So that's the way we're going to try and do it now. Psalm 62. This is what David says. Now, there's literally no clue as to what's going on here. There's nothing. You know, there's nothing in the title. There's nothing in the description. You have no idea what's happening, except that like a lot of things in David's life, something bad is happening. And so here, here it is. This is what he says. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. That is Psalm 62. So let's pray. I'll make a few quick comments and we can chat about a few questions and see, um, see what the Lord brings to our minds. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this evening in your son's name. Lord, of all of us, as all of us gather here, with, we've had troubling days or troubling weeks, or we have things that are on our minds and things that are weighing on our hearts. Help us to put those things into perspective. Help us to set aside the problems of our daily lives and help us to recharge our, our spiritual batteries as we think about your word. We think about David's words and just help energize us and help us to be able to live for you better the rest of the week than we have so far this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we don't know what's happening, but obviously David is upset. The first two verses, he's sort of talking to himself. And I have a question. What do you guys think about what he says here in the first two verses? It says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. What does it mean to wait in silence? What is David saying? Have you guys ever waited in silence? Something bad is obviously still happening. And he says he's just simply going to wait in silence. And he reminds himself that God is his rock, something he can hold on to. But what does it mean to wait in silence? Maybe. So, I mean, that, that's what I'm thinking, because it's, it's, it's an interesting phrase. I, I haven't, you haven't heard it so far. We're in Psalm 62. You haven't heard any of it. You haven't heard that at all. You hear 
crying out to God. I mean, how many Psalms have we had where David says he's crying out to God and trusting him, but now he's not crying out to God. Now he's sort of talking to himself and saying that um, my soul waits in silence. So what I think is obviously yeah. When I faced cancer, lung cancer, in the water, twice, the first time. Um, what I was saying was that obviously his soul um, is very heavy. He's greatly burdened by something. And I could relate to that when it came to having cancer. And they want to remove. Um, my lower right lobe of my lung and it's you're in shock mm -hmm. you're just waiting in silence you don't know what to feel you don't know what to think you just know you have to trust you don't know what the future holds so it's 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 kind of a stretch, I think, of your, of your belief. You know what? Faith. faith. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Faith. Yeah. I mean, he's, um, do you think that, I think what you're saying is, is right. It's hard to get inside his mind and see what he's thinking. And the Psalms are so beautiful because they put words to what ordinary people do think is david is david like fatalistic like um god's in charge so i'm just gonna uh, i don't need to worry or is he so numb and uh, scared or uncertain that he doesn't even know what to say so he's just sitting there sort of like um with with not even words to like not even words to speak, sort of like Romans 8, where you, you just, uh, you don't even know what to say, but the Holy Spirit can take what's in your heart and translate it to God on your behalf. And is that where David is, or is he more like, God will take care of it? It's, yeah. Um, for, me, for me, I kind of, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I kind of read it as... Um, I mean, there's been times in my life when um, God has indicated to me to wait quietly on him. And, of course, there's other passages that talk about waiting on the Lord and not uh, making efforts for yourself uh, or saying something. But anyways, I'm not very good at that. And um, it strikes me similar to that in this fact that it says, my soul waits in silence for God only. Like, what else could you wait for? You could try to talk your way out of or through something or you could try to deal with a person that's um that you're you know having trouble with or, or whatever but instead of uh basically taking the initiative or taking it upon yourself does this make sense to try to fix something he's waiting for he's waiting for god only um as the source of help like he can't do it himself does that make sense yeah i i, I think it does and it's like I said, it is, it is hard to know exactly what he's saying because you can't talk to the guy. You know, if you could have a conversation with him, a lot of things could become clear. But I think it, it has to mean that he does trust that God will help him because he goes on sort of giving himself a, a, a pep talk almost about God is my rock. God is my rock. So he does trust God. But I don't think that means that he's necessarily just sitting there content knowing that God will fix it because that's not the way, that's not the way we live our lives. I mean, I don't think a normal human person can be so, I don't think many people are fatalistic enough where they just, no matter what's going on in their life, they say, well, God's in charge. So, you know, I'll just put it in his hands and with, with, with no emotion, like in their heart, in their, you know, privately, no emotion. So I think maybe it's both like Wanda said, a trust, a real trust, but still he has to tell himself this because he repeats himself in verses um, five through seven. He repeats himself. It's like he needs to tell himself again because he's not happy, even though he does trust God. 
Yeah, sometimes we can think maybe our help can come from another direction if we just cry out enough to someone or something else. Um, Yeah, and the word here means not just silence, but rest. And so it can be translated differently depending on the context a bit. But it, it gives the idea that it's not just uh, stopping saying words. I think of like Job spends three days not talking before he starts the, the, retort, the debate with his friends but he is moaning and groaning and wrestling with God. And, but he's sitting there in silence, the Hebrew says. So that like silence is, it, it's not like the quiet game mm-hmm. kind of a silence. It's emotional often, especially in a Hebrew sense. They were much more willing to be open with their emotions than we are. We tend to be very stoic. And, and I think the idea of faith and trust and resting in God, not trying to come up with our own solutions is probably gets best at the heart of what's going on here. Saying, God, I'm going to leave this in your hands, even though I'm still going to try to go about my life. Say you've got a decision that you're trying to make. It doesn't mean that you just, freeze and stay in bed for for five days because you can't do anything without some direction from god but it does mean that you you try to instead of being constantly anxious give up some of your worry to god in that particular issue and let him determine how you need to approach dealing with it Verses three through four, he has this, um, he switches almost, and it's, it's almost as though he's referring to the people who are attacking him or the people who are against him. And he's asking them, you know, it's sort of, he compares himself to like a, a wall that's about ready to topple over or a, or a fence that's about ready to fall down. He's like, how long are you guys all just going to rush and attack this tottering edifice? I mean, David seems to see himself as really in a pretty bad spot. And he says, you know, their only plan is to rip him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. He's describing the people who hate him, who hate God, actually. David has a lot of problems. Anytime you're in a leadership position, you always have a lot of problems. But David really had it, had it pretty bad. And verses 5 through 7, he reminds himself of things he's already said. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. It's like he's telling himself to just keep, um, to keep waiting, to keep trusting. My hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Last week, Andrew talked about all these images of God as this, this unmovable force that a believer can cling to in bad times. And David just piles them up here. And he's, he's reminding himself of these things. On God rests my salvation or my deliverance and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Reminding himself that even as he's in a really bad situation, the only one who can deliver him is God. And that's who he needs to wait for. Instead of desperately trying to find his own way out of the problem. Verse 8, Verse eight, he sort of turns and is giving advice to people. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And that sort of ties into what we talked about on Sunday, Andrew. God wants to hear from his people. You know, if we really belong to him, he wants to hear from us. And that's not a that's not a New Testament thing. That's a God thing. This is David in the Old Covenant. When it wasn't possible to have the closeness of relationship you can have now before Christ came. But you hear David talking about God in such 
familiar tones. Sometimes we can get the idea in the Old Testament, God is distant. And, you know, he is kind of distant in the fact that you can't go directly to him in the inner compartment of the temple. You have to have a priest do the sacrifice for you and everything. But there's still the relational closeness in the love that's there. And this is David telling people um, his advice, because that's what he's doing, is it just pour your heart out to God when you don't know what to do. Because he's the refuge for us. In verses 9 and 10, he's still talking to the people. He reminds them, like, you know, like Ecclesiastes, like his son's going to remind people about how um, things in this world are temporary. The wicked people, um, it's all going to wash out in the end. God's going to take care of them. And you need to trust in God and not these things here on earth. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop at the last question with verses 11 and 12. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. What is David saying here in verses, uh, especially in verse 12? David's saying, you know, I've heard this many times before, power belongs to God and that to you, O oh Lord, belongs steadfast love. I've, I read someone else translated as commitment. God has commitment. He has love. God is, is with his people. For you, he's talking to God, you will render to a man according to his work. What is, what is David saying there at the end? I mean, that's how it ends. What's he trying to get across to people who are reading this? That's that chesed, covenant loyalty, which yeah. we've talked about multiple times in Sunday school and other places. When he says, you will render to a man according to his work, what is David saying? Is it a threat? Or is it a comfort? What is David saying here in this song? Because that's kind of a weird way to end, if it's a threat, but what's he saying? Does anyone have a different rendering in their translation that might make it a little bit different? What do you have? Oh, that's right. You hate the microphone. Here, I'll hold it here. Just speak. It says, verse 12, unfailing yeah. love, O Lord, is yours. Surely you repay all people according to what they have done. Okay. So what's he saying? Is, is this like, is David closing with a threat? Maybe he is. Or like a warning, hey, you, you better make sure you stick with God or else, or is this sort of more of a comforting thing? What's he saying? Okay, so you have to, to you, O Lord, belongeth mercy. Okay, yeah, so the, the, part, the point is the last one. For you will render to a man according to his work. So what? Okay. I think it's more of a warning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you can look at it two ways. One, well, first of all, I think he's telling them that they need to, they need to trust God. They need, like David's doing, they need to wait in silence for God or cry out to him, but you know, they need to trust him in bad circumstances. And he tells them that God is faithful. God has, is committed to his people. God has steadfast love or steadfast, God will stick with you if you belong to him. There is a passage in Habakkuk that Paul likes to quote a lot. In Habakkuk chapter two, um, a lot of people, not all, some people haven't read Habakkuk because it's buried in the Minor Prophets, but it's like this dialogue between the prophet Habakkuk and between God, where Habakkuk opens the book by saying, God, there's just so much horribleness everywhere. You know, when is, when is, when are you going to just, you know, fix, fix this country? You know, it's just a mess. And God responds to him and says, aha. I am going to fix this country. I'm going to send the Babylonians and they're going to kill everyone and conquer everyone. And then Habakkuk is like, whoa, I didn't mean to fix it like that. I mean, come on, let's not, no, come on. These are, you know, he's like, these are horrible people. That, that's not what I meant. 
you know, when I said fix it. And in Habakkuk chapter 2, one of the things God says is the, the just will live by faith. Saying, or basically like, if you belong to me, you need to trust me and live by faith. In, even as the Babylonians, like the ISIS of the day, come in and destroy everything, uh, you need to trust me. Yeah. And Paul quotes that all the time. It's one of his favorite things, you know, the, 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 the just shall live by faith. And that seems to be the, you know, the exhortation that David's closing with. David's saying, I am waiting on God. He's told himself twice this, like pep, as a pep talk to himself. I need to wait on God, trust in him. And then he tells the people sort of his own lessons. Listen, everyone, you all need to just, you need to pour your hearts out to God when you don't know what to do, because he's the only one who can deliver us. And he says, don't trust in these other things. Don't trust in becoming rich. Don't trust in uh, all of these things. They're all going to go away. All of, it's, all of it's gone. And he says, God has steadfast love, and he will render to a man according to his work, saying, if you are faithful to continue to trust in God, he will be there for you, and he will make it all right in the end. And that's it's not a warning. The tone, you know, it's the same words, but the tone is different. It's not a warning. It's not, you better be good for goodness sake, or Santa's not going to be there. It's, guys, stick with God. He mm -hmm. is worth it. That's what he seems to be, what he's closing with. Yeah, there's a really significant thread here that ties, runs through virtually the whole Testament, and that's this idea of the faithful remnant. The the majority of the nation has rebelled against God. They've, they're in sin. And yet almost all the way through the old Testament, you see these faithful people, whether it's Moses and Joshua or it's, it's Nehemiah or Daniel or other, depending on where you're at in Jewish history. But um, I think this is really comforting for us because we can look at the state of the church or the state of our nation and be rightly concerned about where the majority of people who maybe would claim to be Christians are at and yet recognize that this has always been the case through Israelite history, through church history. It hasn't been about these big empires that are faithful to God and, and you're able to just be part of these, these great, uh, kind of civilizations obeying God. It, rather, it's been small remnants in the midst of broadly pagan empires. And, and so I think we can take comfort in knowing that even when politics are totally a mess and uh, there's persecution probably coming on the church, like in spite of those things, we can still trust God. And we can still live in a faithful way, even in the midst of a culture that doesn't care anything about God. And because that's going to be our future, that's a comforting fact. What are the thoughts does anyone have on, on anything in the psalm, really, that we, that we read that you wanted to chat about or have a question about? Yeah. Tyler. Yes. Well, I see here in the beginning, you know, you're talking about waiting uh, silently for God. Yeah. And I'm thinking that part of the reason you do that instead of taking your own position is sometimes you bring vengeance on people that shouldn't be brought vengeance and so I was thinking of the verse that says vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord that we need to wait on God to fix things sometimes instead of doing our own thing because it can make the problem a lot worse and you might be carrying out vengeance on somebody that really doesn't need it yeah I, I think that's that's right I mean David is committed to, to just let God of it, whatever it is. And he trusts God. And he's just going to let God fix it. That's really, really clear. 
What are you going to say, Wanda? It's like today. Um, it, 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 we got to wait on the Lord for healing of the land right now, for him to fix it. Yeah, especially after last night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all, all you can do, how many, I mean, how many people to, I mean, well, th this is where it gets really practical. I mean, no, we're not being, we're not being persecuted like David, but it, but the point is, is that you, you look at, you know, when you, when you look at what happened last night, none of those gentlemen came off very well. And then you think, is that, is that all you have to hope in? And you're thinking you just need to you all, all you can do is wait in silence and trust God that there is a kingdom coming where there will be no elections, no primaries, no debates and no policy things and no, um, no, nothing like that. You know, there, there's a better time coming and that's, that's what we need to look forward to. And if you don't have that to look forward to, all you have to look forward to is whatever that was last night. And that's not a very hopeful future you know um even if you hold out hope for 2024 it's going to be the same thing all over again with different faces you know the same plastic smiles and cheap slogans and it's it just never ends and um we have a hope that's beyond this messed up world so that's very helpful well uh, also i think there's resolve here in uh, verse two, he's, I shall not be greatly shaken. So wh whatever's going on, he's pretty, you know, whatever's going on around him, he refuses to remove his eyes from God, it seems like. And I think it says that again. Um, yeah, in six. In, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so there's, and, and my stronghold, he just has this really um, firm stance that he's not going to be shaken. And so I'm, I, I think we can take comfort in that, that we shouldn't be shaken either, no matter what we see going on around us with all the chaos, possibly. Yeah, because we serve a God who's in charge. David knows that. That's why he can. That's why he can say the things that he does. So it's a. You know, as I said, if you wanted to paraphrase what David's getting across in the very last two verses, it's that if you belong to God, you need to live by faith, even though things might look really bad right now. We just need to trust in the Lord, and know that He's going to fix everything one day. And God's. God's span of time is much larger than ours. And uh, it's very funny when you look back on things in your life that might have been really like the most important things to you at one time. And now you look back and you think it, it, like, it almost has no relevance for your life anymore. Or th hobbies that you had or things that you did or a job that you had that was, it was important. But now with the perspective of how many years since in your whole life, you can look back and say, that was nice, but it has nothing to do with you anymore. It has no hold up. Things pass. And we can see that even in our own lives. And with God's perspective, things really do pass and things really do fade away. And he takes a much longer view than we do. So that's helpful to know too. Any other thoughts or ponderances about Psalm 62? Huh? Yes, take the microphone. Um, for some reason, um, my Bible doesn't ch tell you that he waits in silence. It doesn't say that. Well, read verses one and two. It says, I find my rest in God alone. He's the one who saves me. He's, he alone is my rock. He's the one who saves me. He's like a fort to me. I will always be secure. So yours says, read verse one again, slowly. It says, I find my rest in God alone. He's the one who saves me. I find my rest in they God alone. It rest, which is okay. a very viable translation of that Hebrew word. Well, that still gets the same thing across is you, you, you're at rest and you're at, at, I don't know if at peace really gets it across, but 
the place where you the place where David is finding rest is in God as bad things are happening to him. So I think you can, I think you still get the the point across. Um, that that's why it's nice to have different translations because they if they're all the major English translations are good and when you compare you kind of puts guardrails around the different nuances and it's 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 helpful like mercy and um, my soul finds rest instead of um, my soul waits in silence. Yeah.